All right. Hello, Web Shatterers. Thank you all for attending our session this afternoon. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Shri, who is an India-based ENT. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end. With that being said, Dr. Shri, you may start whenever you're ready. Okay. Is that being shared? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Shri Kadapa Rao. Uh, I'm a consultant, ENT, head and neck surgeon from Dr. Rao's ENT group of hospitals, Hyderabad, India. And this is my second time being on Web Shadowers. And it's like season two for me. And I'm super excited for this. And I'm Really grateful to Web Shadowers for being, uh, you know, for re-hosting me here. Uh, well, uh, something about me. This is uh, something I talked about uh, uh, in my previous session also, but I just wanted to go over a little brief about it. So, yeah. I did my med school uh, uh, in PS Institute of Medical Sciences uh, for four and a half years. See, I, as I told you, I hail from India and our medical system is a bit different. So uh, from that of US and UK, uh, uh, we get into med school after uh, giving our national entrance examinations after our plus one and plus two is done. So um, uh, during my med school, I passed out in distinction um, and I was awarded gold medal by the uh, then chief minister of our state. Uh, it's his equivalent to governor of your state. It's and later, uh, I completed my one year rotational internship in um, Narayana Medical College. So uh, that will be posted in all uh, different medical and surgical branches. And then I cleared my national entrance examination once again, and I opted for otorhinolaryngology um, in Pratima Institute of Medical Sciences, which is for three years. And then I gave my exit exam there and I stood as university topper by God's grace. And I did my senior residency in um, uh, he uh, head and neck surgery at a state-run tertiary center called Government ENT Hospital in Hyderabad. Then uh, I did my uh, fellowship in cochlear implant surgery for about six months in PT Nuja Hospital, uh, Mumbai. And currently I have my private practice. And uh, as I told you, I'm the director and consultant at DNT at our hospitals. Luckily I practice along with my husband and my in-law who are also uh, ENT surgeons. So, uh, so, uh, so today's presentation, uh, I'll be giving a brief on the anatomy of uh, nose and paranasal sinuses. And uh, I'll make you walk through along with me uh, to, uh, you know, uh, about how to diagnose and manage a few case presentations on the nose and sinuses. Okay, the external nose is uh, pyramidal in shape and just inferior to the nose, we have the anterior nase or the nostrils, which open into the vestibule of the nasal cavity. And the paranasal sinuses are the air-filled spaces or extensions of the nasal cavity. There are a pair of uh, sinuses above the eyes called the frontal sinuses, a pair below the maxillary sinuses, which are pyramidal in shape, and a pair in between the eyes called the ethmoidal, and a pair behind the eyes called the sphenoid sinuses. So entering into the nasal cavity, this is the endoscopic view of the nasal cavity, which I presented over there. And here we are passing the endoscope through one of the nasal cavity, basically through the right nasal cavity. And here we can see the septum, which separates right to the left, the flesh inferior turbinate. And we are passing through the endoscope. And this is the floor of the nasal cavity. And as we pass through the endoscope, we enter the coina or the posterior nares. And this is the nasopharynx, which we are able to see. And this is the place where the nasopharyngeal swabs were taken for this uh, COVID testing and also 
this is the nasopharyngeal area just behind the nose and what you're able to see here is the eustachian tubal cushion and here you can see a slit light opening called uh, the eustachian tubal opening so it connects the eustachian tube uh, mainly it is useful for the ventilation of the middle layer and yeah this is the middle turbinate and just lateral to the middle turbinate is an infundibulum where all the sinuses the maxillary the frontal as well as uh, the ethmoidal sinuses you can see these tiny openings they drain into this ethmoidal infundibulum so one more important structure that you need to know about in case of anatomy of the nose is the olfactory nerve which is mainly useful for the sense of smell and this is the cut section of the nose and we can see the inferior turbinate or the flesh which i have seen uh, which i have shown you earlier and this is the middle turbinate and you know there will be the olfactory bulb which is a part of the brain which lies just above the nasal cavity the branches of these olfactory nerves they run through the cribriform plate a plate a bony plate which separates up the nasal cavity from uh, your brain and these olfactory nerves they provide special sensory innovation to the nose the sense of smell so with this brief anatomy uh, let's get into the case presentation proper i'll just have a check at my time yeah So starting with the case one, case scenario one, I would like it to be much interactive. Uh, you can just uh, keep on answering the questions. I'll be popping up the questions in a, a few times. Okay, a 25 year old male presented to us with the complaints of uh, nasal discharge and left ear pain. On elaborating, uh, uh, he had the nasal discharge since uh, one week, which was associated with the uh, post nasal drip headache body pains also he developed left ear pain since two days and his ear pain aggravated on chewing drinking water talking or and even opening his mouth this headache and uh, pains they relieved temporarily on taking pain medications and the most important thing what we need to ask right now in this COVID era is whether there is any history of loss of smell and he denies any history of loss of smell and he had no history of some similar episodes in the past. The past medical and surgical history, didn't, it was not relevant. He didn't give any significant past medical and uh, surgical history. So we started with our routine ear, nose and throat examination. The one who is, so this is me. And the one who is sitting opposite to me, she's not a true patient, she's my IPA. She just volunteered herself for being a practice patient. And I put up this video particularly because I wanted to make you guys feel that you're truly sharing an ENT surgeon and that too, all the way from India. It's a, it's a kind of intercontinental sharing which is happening. So I just put up this, so this is our setup. This is how we do a physical examination. We put on the headlight and uh, we examine the nasal cavity with the help of a speculum. This is called the Thuricum's nasal speculum. Mm -hmm. And some examiners or some otorhinolaryngologists, they use a clean speculum also. So we just check the nasal cavities this way. And this is called anterior rhinoscopy. And then we examine the oral cavity with the help of a tongue depressor. And once we depress the tongue, we'll be able to see our oropharynx. And also we examine uh, the ear, ear pinna and the surrounding area, surrounding mastoid area, et cetera, whether there are any previous scars or surgeries, et cetera. And also we palpate for the jugular digastric lymph nodes. And the most important thing we need to check when the patient comes for this uh, nose uh, problems is that we check for sinus tenderness. So we also check for sinus tenderness and this is how we do it. For the maxillary sinus, we uh, put some pressure over the cheekbones and ask whether they have some pain. And the, for the frontal, we check under the bony brows. And, and uh, for the ethmoids, we check 
along the medial campus of the eye as shown. So uh, this is the summary on a routine ENT examination. In our case scenario, the patient had, a true patient had thick on anterior rhinoscopy. He had some thick purulent nasal discharge coming out from the left nostril. On paranasal sinus tenderness, he found that we found that he had tenderness of, on his left maxillary sinus area. And uh, the ear pinna and the surrounding, they appeared normal. On examination of the oral cavity and those oropharynx, there was thick post nasal drip, which was seen in the oropharynx. And on head and neck examination, there were no palpable lymph nodes. Then we check uh, the nose and, of course, the ears through an endoscopy. And when we pass the endoscopy through the nose, we call it as nasal endoscopy. And because this is done for a diagnostic purpose, we do this as diagnostic nasal endoscopy. And here, we are passing the endoscope through the right nostril now. We can see the septum, the partition wall, which separates right to the left, this one. And the flesh, which you are able to see the inferior turbinate. And finally, we enter the posterior coina or the nasopharynx. So we need to make sure that we do not injure any of the surrounding structures while performing this procedure. Of course, we give a numbing spray and a decongestant also. So this is the middle turbinate which you are able to see. We give this decongestant spray also uh, along with a numbing spray before doing this procedure, which makes the patient even more uh, you know, comfortable during the entirety of the procedure. And uh, now we're passing the endoscope through the left nostril. Here we can see the septum, but there's a small projection spur, and this is the inferior turbinate. And see here we can see a very clear, thick purulent discharge on the left side, which was not much observed on the right side. And you can also see that as the patient is talking, the eustachian tube, the tubal cushion, it's moving. It moves. Okay. So then we did an endo, auto endoscopy to check the status of the ear, the ear kennel, and the ear drum. And this is the auto endoscopy of the right ear drum. And by the way, this is how a normal uh, looking ear drum looks like. And on the left ear, this is the situation. There is a mild sediment, but yeah. So what, what do you guys think? What has happened to the ear drum on the left ear, on his left ear? Okay, I'm not able to get the answers. If you guys are following this. Okay, this condition is uh, the, known as acute suppurative uh, otitis media, where uh, this condition is known as acute suppurative otitis media, where you can see thick pus which is being collected behind the eardrum. It is inflamed. Yeah, I'm getting the answers. Most of you are answering, it's, it looks inflamed, infected. Yes, it is definitely infected. So this side, it's a normal looking eardrum. The other side, it is entirely bulged. And you can see the leash of blood vessels which are radiating through and the complete zone of hyperemia. So this indicates uh, that there is some sort of infection which is going on and that it, it's time that it's, it may burst suddenly also. So this condition, as I told you, as I mentioned, is known as acute suburative otitis media. And this occurs when there is some infection which is happening in the behind the nose. And from the eustachian tube, the previous slide which I've shown, the infection is being spreading to the ear because of the lack of ventilation. And uh, this is the reason of uh, his ear pain. And he was also able to 
complain ear pain whenever he is moving or whenever he is uh, talking is because of the movement of the eustachian tube which is happening so uh, you know the diagnosis now what do you think is a diagnosis so i'll put it this way for you this is an acute rhinosinusitis and you know what has happened directly in the ear with left ear acute suppurative otitis media we call this as acute rhinosinusitis because this time duration is very short it may be just acute because of some uh, super added bacterial infection and this infection is being spreading to the ear and so this is acute suppurative otitis media and how do you manage this so we go ahead and because this is acute we have to start the patient on oral antibiotics and we also give them some nasal and oral decongestants and some mucolytics in order to break the phlegm and the mucus whichever it's there and of course some symptomatic pain medications for them to get some relief and once again we review the patient after 10 days by the time which the patient would have completely uh, gone to normal condition so coming to the case scenario 2 a 25 year old male presented to us with the stuffy nose since 2 years on um, history of present illness he had nasal block or stuffy nose or obstruction in the nose since 2 uh, years it is associated with uh, uh, mucopurulent nasal discharge and post nasal drip See most of the nose cases, they present most uh, nose complaints. Patient they complain with the stuffy nose or watery discharge. The symptoms appear the same. It all depends on the uh, examination uh, and uh, the findings, whatever you are going to see. So there will not be much change uh, in the history other than the time duration. Uh, this uh, mucopurulent discharge, it it got aggravated on exposure to cold weather. or whenever uh, he consumes cold items he took several courses of antibiotics and antihistamines but just relieved temporarily from the symptoms he also complains of uh, dull aching facial pain and dry cough since uh, several months he also has some decreased hearing since few months in both the ears this is really important thing which needs to be noted he denies any history of loss of smell or any discharge ear discharge or ear pain and he denies any history of gross change in the voice or uh, hoarseness of voice he did not give any significant uh, past or uh, medical or uh, surgical history um on the routine e and examination the anterior rhinoscopic examination of the nose the nasal septum was found deviated to left which i'll be showing you in the next pictures he has some swollen nasal mucus or the boggy nasal mucus and some hypertrophied inferior turbinates on paranasal sinus tenderness he uh, eliciting that he had bilateral maxillary sinus area tenderness the ear pinna and the surrounding as usual they appear normal on examination of the oropharynx it was congested and uh, on head and neck examination there were no palpable lymph nodes and now uh, a nasal endoscopy through the right nasal cavity so this is what is found the entire mucosa was boggy and the turbinates were swollen hypertrophied inferior turbinates were seen and that was on the right side and on the left side you know what's happening here the nasal septum the partition wall which separates right to the left it is attached to the left side it is completely bent and in such a way that i was unable to pass uh, or advance my scope further so that's the situation the right was uh, hypertrophied and the left was completely the nasal septum was completely bent on auto endoscopy this is the picture now what happened to both the ears any guesses okay i'll i'll uh, i'll show you how a normal ear drum looks like so that you can just compare and uh, let me know what's happening with the 
your RUMs in this case scenario. Okay, some are answering this as um, inflamed. No, it is not inflamed. Any more guesses? Yes, now most of you are getting it. Yes, it's very clear of you were inside. That is, it is entirely filled with fluid. Hmm. Most of you are answering this. So right here, and of course in the left ear, you are able to see this clear transparent fluid, which is present behind the eardrum. So basically it is within the middle ear. The external ear is absolutely normal, the external artery canal. This is a normal looking eardrum and this is entirely filled with fluid. And you can also appreciate the air bubbles which are seen here. And this air bubble, it almost making mimics a heart-shaped one. It, it's just making some emojis. So this is once again air, air bubble. So this condition, this uh, scenario is called glue ear. Both are glue ears. Yes. This is basically not an infection. So we call this as a glue ear or non-suppurative otitis media. The previous one, it was entirely inflamed, infected. It was, uh, it was as if it was going through bulge out and uh, pop out. But this is basically retracted because of some negative suction which is happening in the uh, middle ear. And you can see uh, this retraction, the negative suction, it is pulling the eardrum even more inside. So this usually occurs when there is some block at the eustachian tube due to chronic or repeated sinus infections or persistent allergic rhinitis uh, where patients complain con continuous stuffy nose. They may not be able to appreciate the decreased hearing, but this patient, because he was quite young, he was able to appreciate this. And when we accidentally check in, we notice this. And this is very common in children because they have repeated adenoid and tonsil infections. So it's very common for uh, children to get uh, glue ears in them. And uh, we go ahead with the uh, VT or ventilating tubes for them. But we need to know what is the root cause for this. And in this particular situation, this patient had a gross DNS. So we need to evaluate further. Why did this patient being so young, he developed this uh, both uh, serous otitis media or non-suppurative otitis media. So how would you like to proceed? What would you like to do when the patient presents to you with this scenario? His nasal cavities are this way and his ears are this way. What are the next investigations you would like to order for this patient. Let's be interactive. I guess there is some lag. Okay. Yes, some of you are answering that. Scans, what kind of scans? Is it an MRI or is it a normal ultrasound or OCT scan? Screening the eyes, okay. CT scans, yes. Yes, CT scan. And what about the ears? You like to leave uh, the ears that way? Okay, for the nose, 
we go ahead and do a CT scan of nose and paranasal sinuses. As I told you, these are all these are bony structures and the bony structures are well appreciated in a CT scan, a computer tomography of nose as well as the paranasal sinuses because we need to know the status of sin, uh, sinuses also because when the patient, we need to check whether the patient has some um, hidden sinus infections or some biofilms which are happening and the status of the other any blocks at the level of the eustachian tube. And for the ears, we would like to proceed with the audiological investigations. What is the degree of hearing loss? What is the type of graph you are getting? And um, the amount of hearing loss the patient is suffering with. So uh, before I proceed uh, to the, um, and show you how the CT scan of this patient uh, looks like, I'll just very briefly explain you how to interpret a normal uh, uh, CT scan so that you can understand how a disease CT scan would like, look like. Probably you can just interpret yourself also. It's quite easy. Okay, uh, in CT scan, always remember the bony things appear chalky white in color. The air, see the surrounding air, the air inside the nasal cavity, inside the sinuses look jet black in color and any kind of soft tissue appears gray in color. So black, jet black, chalky white and gray. These three, three things are the ones you need to remember. Okay, I'm just starting. So uh, once again, I'll just uh, stop here. See, uh, in these are the coronal sections of uh, the pay of uh, mm, the patient which I'm going to present, the normal CT scan, the coronal sections are the one where we are chopping you this way from anterior to posterior. The cuts are not this way, this way, from the tip of the nose to behind your brain, we are chopping and you get a section for every 0.4 millimeter distance. Okay, so we are chopping from front to back and this is the tip of the nose. This is the nasal septum which separates right nostril to the left nostril. And this jet black thing is the space, the airway, nasal airway. And here at the top, you're able to see two sinuses and these are the frontal sinuses. Before the appearance of the eyes itself, you'll be able to see. And then we are proceeding further. We are chopping further. And you can see the appearance of the eyes starting. And these are the cheeks. And we are proceeding further behind and you can see the appearance of some pyramidal shaped structures which are popping out. And at this section, you can very clearly appreciate the sinuses, the maxillary sinuses. So a pair of eyes and the nasal septum, the turbinates, the flesh, which I have shown you earlier. And beneath the eyes, you'll be able to see this pyramidal shaped structures. And these are the maxillary sinuses, which lie in our cheekbones. And in between the eyes, you are able to see some honeycomb shaped structures called the ethmoidal sinuses. This is how we appreciate. And all these are jet black in color indicated. They are filled with air. They are perfectly normal. And then we are proceeding further. And you can see that the eyes are disappearing. And the sinuses are becoming even more larger. And finally, the eyes have disappeared in total and we are able to see the brain. And at this section, the eyes are completely gone. And this is the brain and these are the coina. And just above the coina, what you are able to see are the sphenoid sinuses. And these are also jet black. As I told you earlier, a pair above the eyes, a pair in between the eyes, a pair below the eyes and a pair behind the eyes. So these are behind the eyes and these are the sphenoid sinuses. Okay, these are also perfectly normal. Then to this basic introduction, let's go ahead and hit our case scenario. So I'm just, uh, uh, you know, presenting this uh, a CT scan, just go through it and interpret what has happened to our patient. Eyes, cheeks, sinuses, sinuses, turbinates.
for those peanuts. Okay. Now I have some uh, multiple choices for you. So you'll be answering uh, or interpreting what has happened to our patient now. Which sinuses are the red pointed ones? All of you have given the right answer. The answer is, uh, yes, all have given the right answer. The answer is frontal sinus. You're not able to see the eyes. There's a septum at the tip of the nose, and these are the frontal. And how are they? Are they normal or diseased? Obviously, they are normal. They are entirely jet black. We can see a clear interfrontal septum, and they are filled with air. So our patient doesn't have any frontal sinus. Now, what are these red pointed ones? What are these sinuses now? Once again, the right answer. All are answering it as B. That's the maxillary sinus. So you're able to interpret the CT scan itself, being a pre med student. Wonderful. And these are the eyes. These are the maxillary sinuses. And how are they? Are they normal or are they diseased? Okay, I'll show you how a normal one looks like so that you can just, so these are the eyes and you have this pyramidal shaped things. They should be jet black. How are they? They're not normal. They are uh, filled with some grayish opacification. So that could be probably some pass collection or it could be some polypoidal changes which are happening. So, our patient in this scenario, looking at the CT scan, is suffering with some maxillary sinusitis and his frontals are free. And now what are these sinuses? And how are they? They are normal or are they diseased? They are in between the eyes. They are honeycomb shape and they are in between the eyes. Yes. Once again, most of you are on track. So the answer is ethmoidal sinuses. They are honeycomb shape. And because this, the consistency is maintained, they are filled with air, they are normal. And there's the last one, a fourth pair of sinus. I've given the answer directly. What are those? And whether they are normal or not. This is our coena. This is our brain and the sinus which lies beneath that and behind the eyes. Yeah. Yes, so the answer is sphenoid sinus. 
Okay, and they're pretty much normal. Then uh, we go ahead with an audiological evaluation for our patient because he had bilateral glue ear. Pureton audiometry, we could see that he had bilateral conductive hearing loss. And on impedance audiometry, he had bilateral B type of grafts. I do not want to go in detail with this uh, evaluation because uh, you know I'm more into nose now. I'm just dealing more into nose now. In my previous session, I already talked about this evaluation. I was more entirely into hearing evaluation also. Probably you can go and check in that if you want. And what is the diagnosis? You already know the diagnosis. Looking at the endoscopy itself, you were able to find that the patient had a deviated nasal septum to the left. And looking at the CT scan of nose and paranasal sinuses, you could find out that the patient had sinusitis, maxillary sinusitis. And since the patient had been suffering since a pretty long time with the stuffy nose, we name it as chronic rhinosinusitis because any kind of uh, uh, stuffy nose persisting for more than 12 weeks, we call this as chronic rhinosinusitis. And of course, uh, um, hypertrophic rhinitis because the turbinates were hypertrophied and uh, bilateral glue ears, as I've shown you earlier, with non suppurative otitis media and some amount of conductive hearing loss. So how do you manage this case scenario? You can answer this definitely. So what do you do for a deviated nasal septum? What do you know about it? How do you correct a deviated nasal septum? Do you have any idea about uh, what is the procedure called? It lies within the question itself. We correct the septum. Okay, so for a deviated nasal septum, okay, I don't think you'll be able to answer this. Anyhow, I'll just proceed. We do a septum correction and this is called septoplasty, repairing your septum. And for the sinusitis, we do a FES, this is called functional endoscopic sinus surgery where, yes, some of you are giving the answers now. We do a surgical procedure, of course, and that is a septoplasty, yes. The FES is a surgical procedure where with the help of the endoscopes, without any scars on the outer part, we go inside, like how we did a diagnostic nasal endoscopy. We open the sinus openings, whichever are blocked, and we suck out all the contents, the deceased sinuses are being repaired and we preserve the nasal mucosa itself normally. So this is called functional. And for the turbinates, for the hypertrophic rhinitis, for the huge turbinates with the patient had, we do a turbinate repair. We may do a turbinate reduction surgeries like a turbinectomy where we entirely chop off a part of the turbinate or we may do an inferior turbinoplasty where we partially remove the turbinate and we preserve the mucosa normally. So it depends on surgeon to surgeon and it also varies from patient to patient. And for the glue ears, as I already mentioned earlier, we do a meringotomy where we open, we, where we give a slit in the ear drum and then we place a grommet or a ventilating tube. So I just kept a small video, I didn't want it to you know, put more of blood. So it's very small clipping. How do we do a septum repair? So this is the bent part of the septum, which was bent towards the left side. So the part of the septum, which is bent, this is called extracorporeal septoplasty, where the septum, which is bent, is being removed. And that's the septum, which is uh, being removed. So this is how it appears like a normal septum. It's also called as a quadrilateral cartilage. Most of you may think that our nose, the septum, it's made up of uh, entirely bone, but actually the anterior part is made up of cartilaginous part. That's the reason whenever you have a bar, whenever you get hurt also, it never easily breaks. It, it probably just turns, that's it, but it never uh, breaks because God has given us, it, it's a cartilage. 
and uh, FES with turbinoplasty, as I told you. Septoplasty, I've already shown you. And this is after the turbinoplasty. See the size of the turbinate, it has become very small. And this is a septum which is being corrected. And we re sutured that once again. And On the other nostril, you can very clearly appreciate the opening of the sinuses which we made, the maxillary sinuses. And check out the nasal airway, how clear it has become. And this is the suture which we have taken after we remove the septum. We reshape it and uh, once again, um, place it back and reposition it and then do a normal suturing. And with the ears, this is what we do. This is the endoscopic picture once again. We make an incision in the eardrum. And after we make an incision, see that's the glue which is coming out. It's very thick. It's not normal fluid. It's very thick. thick. It will be like a tug of war whenever we pull out the micro suction cannula. It never easily comes up. That's why I kept the unedited one for you. So, and finally, we suck out all the, in, the entire glue in total. Make sure that everything is sucked out with the help of a micro suction cannula. And then finally, we place a grooming. So it's a ventilating tube. It functions like a mini use, mini use station tube, mainly to provide ventilation for the middle ear. And it falls off over a period of three to six months. And this is the post-operative picture after uh, two months. This is how it looks like. On the right side, we can see the septum. In the midline, the turbinates are entirely being reduced in size, providing enough space to breathe for the patient. And the maxillary sinus opening also is clearly seen, which is widely open. And on the left nasal cavity, once again, it is quite roomy. And this is the corner. You're able to pass the endoscope very freely without any decongestion or numbing spray. And this is the sinus opening, which we opened earlier on the other side. So the patient will be able to breathe very well and he'll be uh, perfectly getting to normal within a month or so. So coming to the case scenario three, I have time left for me. A 45-year-old male presented to us with complaints of nasal obstruction since six months and he also has loss of smell three months on history of present illness he had nasal obstruction since six months which was associated with thick yellowish discharge nasal discharge on blowing out the nose and post nasal drip also associated with itching of the eyes and watering of the nose he has bouts of spell of uh, sneezing in the morning especially in the morning and he has been using nasal decongestant drops uh, for nasal block or else he was unable to sleep during night time if he was not using any nasal drops during the night. He also complains of loss of smell since three months and um, a change of voice noticed by himself and also by others. He had history of some similar episodes in his childhood, but now they became even more worse. In the past medical history, he is a known case of asthma and diabetes also, and is under medication. So, I'm not going to answer this. Just uh, these are spotters. You have to answer by yourself. So, check out this. This is the DNA on the right nasal cavity. The diagnostic endoscopy, nasal endoscopy on the right side. You're going to give the answers for this.
giving the answers. Yeah, I know they look very swollen. Some of you are answering, they are swollen. So what are those? They are grape-like clusters which are plunging out. Wonderful, you know about the turbinates also. Turbinates look swollen. Some of you are answering it as turbinates look swollen. Yes, those are the differential diagnosis also. Swollen, mucus, looks kind of yellowish. Infection, yeah. Thick mucus. Yes, okay. So these are nasal polyposis. They are grape-like clusters which are hanging out. So these are the polyps. That's the reason when I touch with the help of my suction cannula also, they were not bleeding. If it was a turbinate, it will be very painful and it bleeds on touch. But if you check out this, they are not bleeding on touch, they are watery, they are swollen, there is some thick discharge which is coming out and these are organized granulation tissue because of the chronic inflammations which are going on within the nasal mucosa, the nasal mucosa became, becomes inflamed and they become polypoidal. So this is called nasal polyposis, which most of the asthmatic people or most of the people who take inhalers or aspirin, etc., they suffer with this nasal polyposis. Okay, on autoendoscopy, these are the findings. I have just popped out the normal ear, how the normal ear looks also for you, so that you can clearly appreciate the difference between this with the normal ear. Any guesses of what's happening with this ear? Blue ear, polyps, rupture, infected, inflammation. Okay, I, I can understand this is a bit complicated for you to just answer also. So I'll just try to explain what's happening here. See, you can see in the right ear, the entire eardrum, which is supposed to look like this, is entirely draped over the middle ear structures. We can see all the middle ear structures, unlike this normal scenario. Normally, we'll be able to see only the handle of malleus, one of the bone of the middle ear. But in this situation, you are able to see one, two, and even the head of the third bone and a stapedius tendon also. So it's a muzzle of the middle ear and other structures which are present in the eardrum. So it is entirely plastered to the middle ear middle ear and the eardrum will not be mobile in this scenarios. So they also complain of hearing loss because it's entirely blocked. But the patient doesn't have any ear discharge or any fluid. This condition is known as adhesive otitis media. It indicates that the eardrum is entirely plastered or there is some addition of the eardrum to the middle ear and the middle ear structures and it is unable to vibrate. And what is the reason for this? What do you think is the reason for this? From the first thing I was explaining you that there will be a tube called eustachian tube which connects from the nose to the middle ear, from the nose to the middle ear. So the middle ear gets its ventilation only from the nose, from the 
eustachian tube. So whenever there is a block in the eustachian tube or at the nasal end of the eustachian tube, there are some polypoidal or some masses which are blocking the opening of the eustachian tube there, there will be this negative suction which is happening in the middle ear. So when this negative suction goes to an extent that the eardrum will not be able to vibrate, it's like imagine an empty bislary bottle without any water in it. So when there is some negative suction, it goes into and a scenario comes where it suddenly pops up. It goes so deeper. So now it has gone so deeper that the patient is unable to appreciate his hearing also. And what happened to the left ear is the same kind of edesa otitis media, but to an even more extent where one of the bone is there, the second bone is there, but the joint which connects the second to the third bone is being lost, is being destroyed because of the severe negative suction which is happening. And there is an amount of discharge also come in, coming through. So this is called adhesive otitis media with also erosion of the incurostepidial joint. The incurostepidial joint is the joint incus is the second bone, stapes is the third bone, so the joint is also eroded. Why I kept this, uh, uh, this uh, case scenario or this ear picture, even though I'm dealing with uh, a nose thing, is because I just want to wanted to uh, mention to you that we need to check the ear, nose, and throat in total. It's it's, it's not always the patient just presents to you with, doctor, I just have some uh, polyps in my ear. Doctor, I have some glue in my ear. The patient comes to you with nasal block and uh, you have to go through the entire scenario in total. You have to treat, it, treat him like a human being. All these are interconnected, the ear, nose, and throat. So you have to check all these three together when a patient comes to you. That's uh, that's one thing which is important in this E and T. Okay, so you know what are the investigations that uh, you need to perform in this uh, patient because you already know that the patient has uh, nasal polyposis on looking at the endoscopy itself and on the autoendoscopy because he has this, we are going through with the audiological evaluation. But because this is very common in allergic individuals because he has this uh, watery eyes, itching of the eyes and all, you also go ahead and perform a skin prick test, which is the most diagnostic, important diagnostic test for a allergic rhinitis for any kind of allergic patients. I'll explain about you in my next situations. So this is the CT scan of our patient. Just have a look at it. Okay, so you can see that all the sinuses are affected, involved in this case scenario. So the red pointed ones here are the frontal sinuses. They are entirely filled with pus or polyposis. You cannot appreciate the difference here. And once again, here, these are the eyes. And in between the eyes, there is no structure. There are no landmarks. Entire things are lost. They are fully filled with the gray opacity. So it could be pus or it could be polyps or it could be any kind of mass which is herniating. And the maxillary sinuses are full and even the sphenoid sinuses, which are just present in the brain, are full. So actually, I just wanted to ask you a question here. Um, we could actually make a diagnosis just looking, just by looking at the nasal endoscopy. Why do you think that we ordered a CT scan for this patient? I'm running out of time, so probably I'll just give you the answers. This is mainly because uh, you know, there are several important structures which are surrounding uh, the, the sinuses, like the, like the brain, the eyes. 
So mainly to check whether there are any erosions, uh, or there are any bony erosions, or there is any involvement of these important critical structures. So that's the most important reason we go ahead and check the bony window of the CT scan. In case if there are such erosions which are happening, we should plan accordingly. And in this scenarios, we use a navigation guided endoscopic uh, surgeries because it helps us in preventing uh, surgical complications and also complete removal of the disease. This kind of navigation is like a GPS. So whenever you are nearing the important structures, it tells us that, see, you are nearing this. So we can just uh, know our position where we are. Okay. So the audiological evaluation, the patient had bilateral conductive hearing loss and he had uh, C-types on the impedance audiogram. And this is the skin prick test, which I was talking about. So this is an excellent method to detect the allergen. A drop of concentrated solution, allergen, basically is placed on the forearm of the patient as shown. Like this. And uh, with the help of a lancet or a sharp needle, which I'm not going to take on now. With the help of a lancet, we just uh, stick into the dermis through the drop. So basically, we are introducing the allergen into the dermis. So this way. Then a control test here is performed uh, with the help of histamine at first. And a positive reaction is checked when there is some wheel and flare reaction going on within the first 10 minutes. And this is how we elicit the wheel and flare reaction with different diameters. And we check on both the forearms, nearly 44 allergens are introduced into our body and we check the diameter um, of different allergens. Uh, they may include pollen, they may include fungus or even the food items. And the allergens are identified and the patients are advised mainly to avoid these allergens. And you know what, even I actually didn't know that I was allergic to banana until I got this test done on myself. And even my son is allergic to banana. So it's really a useful test. Okay, coming to the diagnosis part, uh, uh, you know the diagnosis. This is a case of nasal polyposis and or because all the sinuses are involved, this is pan sinusitis. And on the right here, this is called a desivotitis media with some amount of conductive hearing loss. And the left here, as I told you earlier, it's uh, the same adesivotitis media, but with erosion of uh, the joint between the second and the third bone. So the ingidostepedial joint uh, uh, erosion with some amount of conductive hearing loss. And how do you manage this? You know what to be done for the nasal polyposis. It's the same way how we deal with the uh, uh, normal sinus uh, infection. The FES, the functional endoscopic sinus surgery. But in this scenarios, it's important that the FES only plays about 50% role. The surgical procedure has only a 50% role. The remaining 50% role it depends on the patient, so mainly like with the help of medical management by providing them with antihistamines, some steroid nasal sprays. And most importantly, avoidance of the allergen. That's the reason we go ahead and perform a screen prick test on the patient and always ask the patient to avoid those allergens because it's really important to counsel the patient about this uh, before the surgery itself and also mention them that in case of there is allergen exposure, there are always chances that these uh, polyps may recur. So medical management really plays a 50% role in this uh, nasal cases of nasal polyposis. And of course, for the uh, left ear, we do a cartilage marring of lasty and ossicular re reconstruction. So whatever bones are being damaged, we reconstruct them and the negative suction is being taken off. Okay, so uh, this is how we perform a nasal polyposis surgery. So these are the nasal polyps which are being visualized. Previously, we used to plug them, but right now, in this uh, most advanced days, we have a micro shaver or a micro debrider where we see these are completely bloodless. They're grape-like things. So we can uh, just shave them off. So this is also called as micro shaver. This has a capacity to 
irrigate with the help of suction, with the help of water, saline continuously, and at the same time, it has the power to chop off and suck away all the contents. So the entire polyps are being shaved off. But the only disadvantage with this micro shaver is that for the beginners, we need to exactly know, know the landmarks because we may shave in the same way and may directly go into the orbit or we may directly go into the brain. So everything we have to work on guardedly. And as I told you, we use a navigation system also for this uh, difficult scenarios. So this is an immediate uh, post-op picture because there is some blood I just wanted to avoid. But yeah, this here you can see the entire polyps are being taken off. And here also all the polyps are being chopped off. And this, this is the airway which is being provided. And this is my suction curve suction where you are able to see the maxillary sinus opening. I'm sorry, there is a lot of blood. I'm extremely sorry. And this is the final picture after 20 days. The sinuses are still healing. But yeah, you can see the polyps are completely disappeared. Okay. All right. I'm just jumping through. Uh, my time is ending. Okay. Coming to the last case. A two-year-old baby brought to us with uh, unilateral nasal discharge on the left side. And it was sudden in onset. And there is no history of cold or upper respiratory tract infection or cough or fever. Anything else uh, would you like to know in this thing? Does this ring any bells? An important question because it's a two-year-old baby, only one side nasal discharge, just within two days. There is no cough, cold. Okay, I'm running out of time. So only thing that we need to ask the parents is whether there is any suspicion of foreign body because this kids they have a tendency to place everything in their nose or in the throat or in the ears because they are quite open to them so that's the thing what we need to ask a nasal endoscopy we did a nasal endoscopy for the patient for the baby under general anesthesia and this is what we found that was a foreign body in the nose. And there was some granulation which was developed there. I'll just show you. So these are all the granulations. This is a turbinate. This is a bloodstream granulation around the foreign body because it stayed there for uh, two days. So within two days, that's the scenario. And this is on the other side. I just checked on the other side to make sure that you're not missing out anything. So this is done under the general anesthesia for the baby. Similar nasal endoscopy which was done in the OPD on a five-year-old child. Because uh, the baby was very cooperative, this is just done in the OPD. So with the help of endoscopy, we went in through and with the normal forceps, we just remove the button which the baby placed. He was quite cooperative. So, hope I'm on time. That's it. Thank you. Hope I'm on time. Yep, timing is good. Thank you so much, Dr. Shree, for presenting for our web shadowers. We loved all the videos and examples that you shared in your presentation, and thank you for answering all of our questions. Everyone, please go make sure you check out her socials. Her Instagram is at drshree.ent. The link to today's Google form has been posted in the chat box and will be posted in the description of the video shortly. Please make sure you fill it out within the next half hour for us to receive verification of your attendance. That's all for today.